And yes, I am so happy to be back after a little hiatus and better yet, we're kicking things off with the awesome Andrew Barker. So Andrew is a geologist with 15 years experience across the exploration and resource definition space, having worked for companies such as Barrick, Northern Star and Evolution Mining. So Aaron, Andrew's current role is exploration manager for Marine and Mineral Metals, an ASX listed junior explorer, who are exploring and seeking to develop the Marine and Lead Silver Copper Gold Project. Uh, it's located in Northwest Queensland in the Carpentary province within the Cloncurry district. And it's also home to many notable mines such as Cannington, Ernest Henry, Dugald River and Eloise. So Andrew will be talking about the history of the project and the importance of serendipity in exploration. So it's going to be a really great session. So yes, thanks so much, Andrew, for joining. It's amazing having you. Thanks, Jess. Look, it's been a, a long time coming, but um, I'm really glad to be here on Geohug. Today's talk is on the Moronan deposit, and it is a technical geological talk about what the team at Moronan have learned over the last 12 months of intense work at Moronan, and how to try and fit Moronan within the spectrum of deposits in the Mount Isa district. It also charts my personal journey as a geologist moving into a new terrain and working to get my head around what I'm seeing in the rocks. Some of the viewers today I've heard may be investors. I don't want, want to warn you in advance. Uh, this talk's really focused on the technical geology. But what I will say is one of the things that attracted me to Moronan was the geological prospectivity I could see. I want to be working on projects that I can see have the potential to make significant discoveries and or to become mines. And I'm just as excited now as when I began, if not more so. Um, look, just this presentation may include some forward-looking statements and please take your time to read through the notices and disclaimers um, from this presentation. So I've called this guide a beginner, this talk a beginner's guide to walking into geological controversies in the Mount Isa district. Um, I, I hadn't learnt that much about Mount Isa in my career prior to coming up here. I spent a lot of time, 10 years in Kalgoorlie and, and five or six years in New South Wales. Um, and the reality is I come up here and I realised that I was woefully ignorant and I had a lot of work to do to catch up and get up to speed with what was going on. The Carpentaria District um, is actually the world's largest zinc province. It's got most of the world's really big zinc mines um, and it straddles the Northern Territory Queensland border. Um, just, I guess, for people not familiar with the area, I'm in Cloncurry. We're roughly sort of 1,500 kilometres from Brisbane. For perspective, Melbourne's around 1,400 kilometres. And for people in Western Australia, it, it's sort of roughly a similar difference distance from Brisbane as Port Hedland is from Perth. There are some really great zinc silver lead deposits in this area. Um, Mount Isa obviously being the standout and this year it's the sort of 100th year since the discovery and the sort of start of Mount Isa mine, but there are other ones including MacArthur River, Century, Cannington, Dougal River. And there's also some really significant copper mines. Again, Mount Isa fits in there, Ernest Henry, um, Mount Gordon or Capricorn, Osborne, Swan. It's an incomplete summary that I've got there, but not only are some of these mines really big, some of them are really profitable and Cannington's really the standout there. So Cannington's only got a 44 million tonne uh, resource um, at some pretty good zinc and lead grades, but a, an amazing silver grade of sort of over 500 gram per tonne. And there was a, when it was at its peak, Cannington was actually the world's largest silver mine and on an annual production basis, producing over 40 million ounces of silver a year. So what's the controversy and what, why does Morona matter? There are a variety of different deposit models that have been proposed for in particular how the Mount Isa system formed, but they have common threads through many of the deposits in the district. Probably the most popular model is the Sindai genetic lead, zinc, silver and epigenetic copper model. So what that's saying is that there was an early syngenetic lead, zinc, silver event and that at some time later on, there's been an overprinting copper event. However, there are also people who propose essentially an epigenetic lead, zinc, silver, copper model, um, which is somewhat analogous, I guess, to it's essentially a zoned model that, that essentially all happened in the, as part of the single system. These ideas have been hotly debated by geologists for over 80 years. I don't have the answer. But working through these different ideas and trying to understand how geological observations may support one of these models or something completely new, is part of being a geologist. 
as is the problem of how, how do you deal with sometimes seemingly contradictory observations. So work in the district around Moronan um, started in around 1984, but it took until 1988 and the first diamond drill hole until the discovery was made. The first drill hole, MND01, intersected 0.6 metres at 11.7% 11 11 lead and 220 gram per tonne silver, and another zone of 6.4 metres at 2.1% lead and 58 grams per tonne silver. And just for context, this was prior to the discovery of Cannington, which occurred in 1990. Geophysics has been a pretty key part of the targeting at, at Moronan, and that includes magnetics, gravity, and in particular, surface and downhole EM. Between the discovery in 1988 to 2022, five different companies had completed exploration work at Moronan, the most significant work being done by Red Metal. The Red Metal team, Rob Rutherford, and in particular, Greg, Greg Carey, did some fantastic geological detective work, which breathed new life into the resource into Moronan and ultimately led to the maiden inferred resource of 30 million tonnes at 6.5% lead and 106 gram per tonne silver and 11 million tonnes at 1.6% copper and 0.8 gram per tonne gold. So Moronan Metals was really a new start for the Moronan project. Moronan Metals was spun out of Red Metal through an IPO in April last year. Red Metals sold 50% of the project and raised $15 million to continue exploring and progressing the project. We commenced drilling in August 2022, less than three months after listing, and to date have drilled over 12,000 metres and relogged a further 15,000 metres of historic core. Our geological model is a live beast and getting better every time we add a new drill hole, and we're currently working on our third version of it. At a local scale, Moronan occurs as a discrete magnetic high within an area of relatively quiet background. The deposit's under 40 metres of tertiary and mesozoic cover, and there isn't any outcrop. The 1 to 100,000 K geological mapping on the right shows Moronan as occurring within the Mount Norna quartzite. Zooming in closer, Moronan's located on a parasitic fold hinge of a larger regional land decline. We interpret the, the majority of the rocks we see as being the Mount Norna quartzite, shown in the yellow. However, the, in terms of the lead silver mineralisation, there are a couple of key horizons, the eastern and the western horizon, shown in orange, and they're shown as the sort of blue and teal uh, layers in the image on the right. There are some um, amphibolites that sort of generally form stratigraphic um, parallel layers and often magnetic highs. And then also, as you can sort of see, some east-west oriented mafic dikes that are, that are later, um, that occur, come in later. So this, this image, these um, are a couple of pictures of what we typically see in the Mount Norna quartzite. It's a mixed samite p -like quartzite sequence. Um, it's turbididic. There's some beautiful graded bedding. We see cross bedding. And obviously, it's been deformed. So there's some, some um, quite beautiful folding of it in places as well. Now, one of the challenges with um, geology, <clears throat> with logging, is that it can be inconsistent. So quality geochemical data collection has been a key part of the, the, um, the program that we've been doing at Moronan. Um, it was started by the Red Metal team, and it helps map out the mineral system, not just the lithology, but also the alteration. And it also feeds into some work that we're doing, thinking about geometallurgical domaining. In the upper graph, um, we're plotting aluminium against vanadium, and you can sort of see there's two main populations, a brown one, um, which is mainly arcos and pelites, you know, um, that's the, essentially the Mount Norna quartzite, the photos of what we we're looking at previously, dominated by feldspars, clays and micas. There's also a second group shown in the pink um, that has low aluminium, but quite high vanadium. So vanadium can be enriched in organic rich shales. However, it can also be mobile in oxidizing environments and get incorporated into hydrothermal magnetite. To sort of test whether this, it might be going into the hydrothermal magnetite, we also plotted up titanium versus chrome um, because chrome should be mobile in oxidizing environments, but whereas vanadium isn't. But what we're seeing is that the chrome is also um, increasing. So that suggests that what we're looking at was potentially, it was probably from an organometallic source or an organic rich shale or some, something similar. 
The reason that's important is will become obvious in the next couple of slides. So when we talk about the BIF horizons, we see them, they, they often occur as three seemingly quite different rocks. There's a carbonate facies, um, which is the main host to the, to the lead mineralization. There's also another facies that's dominated by peroxine rich gain. And more distally, you essentially see what's, and, and one of the reasons these units are called BIFs is essentially a massive magnetite bed with, you know, intercalated P-light. I'm just going to go back and go through that again. Carbonate. Pyroxene. Magnetite BIF. So what the geochemistry is telling us is actually these rocks are essentially from the same protolith. And what that helps us do is model up the, the geological units in three dimensions. Another key part to the story at Moronin is the structural geometries. In this image, we're, we're focusing on an area we call the starter zone, shown in the picture on the right. It's where we have some higher grade lead silver mineralization. The stereo net below the text is plotting poles to bedding and the mean pole to bedding is 63 towards 278. There's also fold related spread away from this mean. And this is consistent with the previous red metal interpretations. The image immediately right to the right of the text, we're looking essentially down the plane of the lithologies. North is to the right hand side of the image. The lithology is shown with the various BIF horizons that we can model. The blue disks are the bedding measurements and the, the pink and blue spheres are younging, dire younging direction measurements. Pink spheres indicate younging is occurring uphole and blue is where youngings occurring downhole. And we can use these to help us constrain the shape of our fold in this area. In the lower image, the blue disks are again showing bedding, but this time we're plotting up fold vergence data. Orange spheres indicate Z vergence and pale green indicates S vergence. Again, these help us model up and get the geometry of the folds correct. Red spheres indicate M vergence, which is what we typically see in hinge zones. These measurements can again help us to identify where there might be parasitic fold hinges that thicken mineralization, which will be important as we move towards updating our resource model. There's a small population of darker green spheres um, uh, that have a S vergence, but indicate an antiform to the east. The bedding foliation, bedding foliation relationship in this area indicates shallower north plunging folds than usual with the east, verge, east antiform east vergence. And the reason for this hasn't yet been resolved. In this image here, we're now looking at a long section along the deposit, looking due east. Um, the, the sort of pink hashed area outlined by the gray, by the sort of gray um, polyline are the MSO shapes from a 2016 scoping study completed by um, red metal. What we're plotting up on there are essentially mineral lineation or lineation features from our structural data. So blue is fold axes, Yellow are intersection lineations, red are stretching lineations, and green are boot and necks. The fold axes, intersection lineations, and stretching lineations are broadly similar and subparallel to the gross plunge of the fold and consistent with, again, what we were seeing from the previous work done by Red Metal. There are fewer boot and neck measurements. However, interestingly, they seem to have a more moderate north plunge. And again, we don't haven't yet resolved why this is and what implications this might have. The key part of trying to figure out what's actually gone on here is the alteration paragenesis and it's a work in progress. Alteration paragenesis, I like to say, is when did the various minerals that we see come to the party? It's a matter of collecting good observations from hand specimen, specimen supplemented with petrographic analysis. And it's a key part of the puzzle that we're currently working on. 
The image on the left is our working paragenesis and we're co constantly updating it as we sort of make new observations. Um, but, and there's still, you know, some work to do to get there. The images on the right, a variety of the different alteration types that we see at Moronin. However, if you want me to talk about the alteration at Moronin, that's a whole new geotug, geohug talk on its own. For the geologists who haven't worked in the Mount Isa district, you've got to come and visit. There's just some amazing mineralogy around here. What I would say about where we are currently though, is that while we have more work to do to flesh out the details, the overall pattern and timings that we see at Moronin appear to correlate well with what's observed at other deposits in the Mount Isa district, including Cannington, which is only 90 kilometers down the road. One of the key alteration phases we see at Moronin is a silica alteration. It appears to form a slightly oblique zone to the bedding as can be seen in the image on the left. The red hat shows our interpreted outline. The core of the silica alteration forms a really distinct pipe shown on the right in the 3D oblique view. And this is strongly correlated with the copper mineralization of Moronin. The image on the right, on the left, is an example of what the silica alteration looks like in drill core. It's variably mineralized with pyrotite chalcopyrite mineralization. Some examples of the drill intercepts within the copper zone are included on the right. In the next section, we're going to look at the zonation of metals and some of the proximal alteration minerals at the deposit. I guess just before we sort of go through in looking at the metals, we're using all the available data. And in the images where we do look at alteration minerals, we're using samples where we have four acid digest data. The next series of images are all taken in the same perspective, which is essentially looking down the plunge of the silica alteration. In the image at the moment, we're showing the copper, we're showing copper. The lead seems to form a halo around the copper zone. As you step out a bit further, you see zinc. And as you step out further again, you see manganese. Now we're just gonna go back and step through the next couple of images. Um, this time sort of showing the relationship of the, the, the different metals with the different alteration. In the core of the system, we have the copper with the silica alteration. As we step out to the lead, that correlates strongly with the calcite gang mineralogy. And as we step out further where we see the manganese, um, this image is not great, but you can see the green. So which is where we're seeing the pyroxene gang mineralogy. So where does that leave us? The current distributions of metals and alteration at Moronin appear zoned from a silica alteration as, as part of a cooling trend with zonation from copper to lead silver to lead zinc. The paragenetic timing of the sulfides hasn't been fully resolved and certainly some of the petrographic work we've done suggests at least some of the copper mineralization appears to post-date the lead silver zinc mineralization. However, all the sulfides appear relatively late in the sequence. Overall, the paragenetic sequence does show a good correlation with other known deposits in the air in the region like Cannington. Further work is required to try and answer these questions, but does it matter unless we can turn Moran into a mine? As we said, since August last year, we've completed over 12,000 metres of new drilling and we're still drilling. Our focus is improving up shallow, higher grade lead silver mineralization within the starter zone, which is where any potential mine at Moronin will commence. And we're also continuing to test and grow the inferred copper gold resource. And that is a presentation there. Look, that probably a bit quicker than I thought it was gonna go. Um, but there's a lot of thank yous in that. Um, Richard Carlton, who's the MD at Moronin Metals and Rob, Rather Rob Rutherford, who's uh, the technical director and Dean Fredrickson, who's our technical advisor. The broader team, Greg Hartshaw and Michael Maud, Darren Sora, Tegan Barker, Matt Hillis. Um, also our you know, partners who've been helping us with the work, DDH1, Nomic Exploration, Core Plan, Clemens Augenstein at Absolute Geoscience and Mike Outhwaite at Lithify, Richard Lilly, Rowena Duckworth, and also Colin and Navanka Miller and their family out at Moronin Station. Thank you so much.